launched its long anticipated attack on Ukraine, striking military posts across the country. An unprovoked war in Europe is now underway. Tonight, tensions in the Taiwan Strait reaching their highest point in decades. China extends military drills surrounding Taiwan. The unprecedented show of force now expected to enter its sixth day.
And I hope that this special lecture will provide a fruitful discussion about the given topics. And I hope that students will also engage uh, by asking questions uh, during the q and So thank you very much. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Karen Leong is currently an associate professor at Tamkang University's Department of Global Politics and Economics. He teaches courses on democratic politics, human rights, as well as on culture, politics, and history of the South Asian He graduated from the National University of Singapore's doctoral degree program in Southeast Asian Studies but also has postgraduate and undergraduate degrees in human rights and political science from the UK as well as the United States. Having spent more than a decade teaching at universities in Singapore, Malaysia, and Taiwan, Dr. Leong's passion continues to lie in the Southeast Asian region. With a keen interest in the burgeoning field of memory studies, Dr. Leong's research is prompted by how it intersects the history and culture of the region. Dr. Leong uh, is currently working on a project which looks at human rights in general, and more specifically, the role of human remains plays in how individuals and communities deal with the aftermath of violence. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all welcome Dr. Harry Yen Leong. Uh, hi, great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so, can I suppose to sit or stand? Okay, I'll, 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 I'll do it my way. I'll uh, basically just stand, I suppose. Um, so, hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Magandang Um This is supposedly the slides that I am going to be talking about today, right? That I'll be, looking at, that I'll be using to try to Sort of exchange you guys about what it is that I'm uh, talking about today. But I, I won't be depending too much on it, except to say that, uh, in terms of what I'm trying to present to you guys, is that when we look at the issues that concerns what could possibly be, what is at this point in time uh, uh, a major conflict, and what possibly could be a major conflict in the Asian community, in East Asian. Uh, in the next decade or so, is that we have right now, uh, in terms of how we look at it, we understand these conflicts in terms of how two powerful nations right, kind of try to contest with each other. And if we look at how media analysis is done on these two regulations uh, on these two parts of the world, uh, it's always put in the light of these very powerful kind of conflicts between this side of the world and that side of the world. So a lot of that analysis, right, is kind of stuck in this particular way of how we look at the power struggle between very powerful countries. But the question that I have to ask today, and the question that I would like to get you guys to think about today is, what do we ask this question in that, what exactly are the Ukrainians fighting for? Right? What exactly are the Taiwanese, in that sense, resisting or fighting for also? Uh, in the future, possibly. So one of the things that we forget is that in the midst of all these issues, in the midst of all these power things between two very large parties, what exactly is going on in terms of how these people within these contexts, specifically in Ukraine and in Taiwan, are thinking about how these issues are playing out? Why do we not pay attention to how people define their sense of identity? One of the things that really strikes me, right, is that if you look closely at the Ukrainians, or even the Taiwanese for that why is it that they've been able to hold out for so long? Is it because of the amount of arms that are being given to them? Is it also, if we look at the Taiwanese case, uh, the Taiwanese should be able to hold out given the amount of armament and kind of assistance that's coming to the US. But our arms, the only way in which these people will be able to sustain themselves. If you look at the youth, the, the conflict in Ukraine, it's been going on for more than half a year. 
And despite their size and supposed lack of uh, resources, they have this large giant that looms over them, and yet they continue to resist. And then you look at Taiwan, given its size and given its population in comparison with that larger party further up north, right? They feel in comparison as well. So the question is, how exactly are these people sustaining themselves in terms of eating an identity that allows them to sustain their sense of who they are alongside with the other with the other ones that we represent the world? So the question that I want to get people to think about today right, is that what exactly is helping them along? What pushes them? Along? What gives them that impetus to be able to survive despite the odds? And so my question is, right, oh, sorry, my answer is, right, to those questions, is that these people have, they, they've kind of, they've developed a very distinct sense of who they are. Sorry, they've, they've developed a very strong sense of who they are. So what exactly does this come from, right? This distinct sense of their identity. What are the, the elements they involved? What are the things that have given them so much fuel to push ahead despite the overwhelming odds? So the answer to that, right, is if we look very closely, uh, and this has a lot to do with my own research and memory studies as well, um, I posit, right, that if we look at all these countries, whether um, even if you include the Philippines sometimes, right? Um, if we look at Taiwan, if we look at the Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine, if we look at even the Philippines, right? There's usually things that people remember. And of course, there are usually things that people disremember or unremember as well. So in the Ukrainian context, right, uh, if we look a little bit deeper into its history. And just take our attention away from how these two parties are fighting with each other, or how the Americans are resisting the Russians, or how the, Amer the Americans or the Europe is using uh, Ukraine as a kind of fulcrum point in the UK by the contest of powers of Russia. There's a very deep sense right, in terms of how the Ukrainians think about themselves. So, one of the things when I was trying to figure this out right, in terms of the Ukrainian resistance with the Russian. Is that there is this very deep sense of who they are through the experiences that they've had with the Russians even before the Second World War? Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard about the Holodomor. The Holodomor. The Holodomor, the Holodomor is the Ukrainian equivalent of the Holocaust. So between the 20s, the 1920s, and 1930s, right, millions and millions of Ukrainians died due to the fact. That the policy that were enacted by the USSR at that time created widespread, um, widespread hunger, widespread famine, right? And that has been a very, very strong focal point in helping Greeks, plus the fact that they were also, in a sense, invaded, right? Very early on by the USSR, and then having to forcibly invade a part of the USSR. All of this plays very heavily and deeply into the sense of who they are as Ukrainians. The really interesting thing about Ukraine as well is that the presence of what some people say, and, and I think this is where exactly uh, Putin, uh, President Putin was referring to when he was talking about right-wing neo-Nazi groups. These are groups of people, right? Uh, especially towards the, the area of the West, not Marxism, right? Where you have these, these groups, right? These groups of militias that have a very strong sense of who they are as Ukrainians to the point, right, where those are the reverse and that's not because we were far right Ukrainian naturally. So that's one way of looking at it, right? How exactly in, in, in a sense, right? Or even when we look at 2014, right, with the revolution that was going on in Ukraine, there was a very strong and distinct sense of who they are when they said, okay, we don't want this pro-Russian constitution. Right? We want to have another, we want to be able to practice our democracy. So, in terms of what I teach in, in fact, I have in South Africa University, which is that kind of when you hear a country or when a country, sorry, when a country has a very strong sense of itself, plus the fact that as you factor in, right, how that particular country is already practicing a very, very strong form of democracy, what it does is that it strengthens, right? And it consolidates that sense of who these people are 
and where they come from. Now, if we look at Taiwan, there has been so much said about how China at some point in time could not, and just uh, I think it was a couple of days ago, or last week, the president of uh, President Xi Jinping has already mentioned that they will be ready to strike possibly within five, next two, five, six years or so, 2027, if I'm not mistaken. Right? But one of the things that we don't take into consideration also is that how exactly are the Chinese themselves feeling about this? Because if we look at the entire dynamic that is out there, right, one of the things that is really going to play a very, very important role in how a possible conflict might pan out is that the, is the level of resistance that people will put up. And that's the thing, right? If we, if we take into consideration the level of identity that the Taiwanese people themselves have about who they are, this is, there is a possibility that this could be a long fraught conflict as well. So how do the Taiwanese look at this? How do they think about their democracy? Right? Something that usually nobody pays attention to, especially when we look at media analysis. They have also, and if you want to talk about the parallels between the Ukrainians and the Taiwanese, is that they also have a very strong sense of um, a lot of politicians in Taiwan at this point in time have been labeled by the PRC government as being independentists, right? These are people who want to be independent, refuse, except the fact that they are part of the PRC. But one of the things that the PRC fails to do also is to realize that over the years, and if we look at surveys, um, it's kind of difficult to do surveys in Ukraine at this point in time, right? But if you look at the surveys that have been conducted in Taiwan, more and more Taiwanese people are beginning, beginning to feel that they are more and more Taiwanese. Not so much Chinese, but Taiwanese. Admit it's that. Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, right. The, uh, what was I saying? Right. So more, more and more people are beginning to develop a, a very distinct sense of who they are as Taiwanese. And also, uh, very interesting thing done uh, in terms of Taiwan, right? Because there's a lot of surveys done there as well. And one of the most recent ones, the World War Sailor, right, is a survey that was done in which people in Taiwan were asked, how willing are you to die for Taiwan? Right. It's a, it's a very important issue, right? But it also speaks a lot to that sense of who these people are when they, when they refer to themselves as the Taiwanese. And a lot of young people out there are saying right, that, yes, we are willing to die in Taiwan. There is also a separate survey that says, okay, well, um, uh, how long do you think you guys, uh, no, how well do you think you would do in the case of a conflict with PRC, in which a large majority of people say, I don't think we're gonna be able to hold out too much, right? There are at least 20 percent of people who say, yeah, yeah, we can do it. We can, we can win this. We can survive this war. So you, you have this very kind of contradictory sense of how they are willing to die for the country, and yet they don't think it's going to win. They're, they're going to win. So when we, when we take all, the, all of this into consideration, right, um, and the, the really important thing to think about also is, Right. When, we, when we look at international relations, right, one of the core things that we think about, one of the core things that we use to measure anything or anything that we would try to understand about international relations is that we look at the nations, right? We we think uh, as far as international international relations is concerned, right? When we talk about material conflicts, it's about power, right? It's about trying, it's about how countries get together, you know, how correct there's a major player, how the players trying to dominate people, the countries, the region, and all that stuff. It's all about how. But we hardly ever take into consideration or add on that very, very important thing in terms of how people understand themselves through their identity. We also, a lot of times, forget to ask this question What impact? Would this conflict have on democracy? Right? How, how does it impact on the people on, on the choices that people should be allowed to make as members of a democratic polity? What kinds of damage, what damage does this kind of conflict do to democracy 
in not just in Taiwan or in the UK for that matter, but as far as the world is concerned. So one of the things that that that, you know, that in terms of analyze how these two countries are going to hold out, and my my kind of gamble, my, my I'm betting on the fact that if there is a conflict threat in Taiwan at this point in time, there is a parallel with Ukraine in that they will be able to hold out, right? Of course, the U.S. would be more than happy to supply arms to Taiwan. There are also strategic problems that our friend, that our you know, PRC would face should they decide to go ahead with whatever plans they have in terms of intensifying the conflict, because there's a large body of water that separates uh, the mainland and, of course, Taiwan, right? So we've got that situation going on. But once you approach the island itself, right, there is a larger problem of a group of people who are more than willing, right? Because precisely of that sense of identity that they have, that they're willing to defend the island, even to the point where possibly they could die. So there are all these questions, right? When we think about international relations, identity, right? Makes it uh, identity, uh, looking at the distinct identity of these two countries, right? That provides the fuel, that provides the way in which people will be able to sustain any form of resistance as far as anyone trying, as far as anyone's concerned in terms of trying to talk about So, this is where my 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 so we just I think we have time for a few more couple of slides over there. Can we just go ahead? Uh, one one slide over there. Uh, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Uh, one more. One more. <laughs> Until we see pictures. Any any pictures? No. No. Okay. Right. So uh, I I I wasn't able to come up with pictures for Ukraine, but this is one of the pictures that um that I took when I was there. Uh, this is the earlier years when I was in Taiwan, right? Uh, and one of the things in which I, I, I kind of took notice of was that, given the fact because there was this space in terms of democracy allowed in Taiwan, people were allowed to go out and express who exactly it is that they are. So you have a very clear indication here of a protester. I think at that time, at the point in time, they were protesting against the president for some policy or anything like that. But you see a lot of this happening in Taiwan. Right, and of course, the revolution that we saw in in Ukraine as well is an example of that space that they took advantage of. Of course, there was a lot of uh, the government clamped down on, on on the protest that was in 2014. But it is exactly this democratic space that allowed people to develop a sense of themselves. There's a very interesting term here that we have in, in Taiwan. Uh, for those of you who understand Mandarin Chinese, right, it's called Ban which is that sense of localism. Right. So a, a lot of times uh, people assume, especially when we look at both the Ukraine and Taiwan, people would say, oh, Taiwan is what's the difference between Taiwan and China, right? They speak the language and they keep the nearly the same thing. What's the difference between Ukraine and Russia? I mean, to a certain extent, Ukraine is no different from Russia. But the thing is, right, despite these similarities, these people have also got very, very strong ideas of who they are. Because of the space that was given to them. So we should ask, right? If that space that they have, that sense of democracy, right? That sometimes, you know, even when you when you look at Taiwan, right, when they think about the kinds of values that they have, the number one thing that they pick up from the back is often we are Taiwanese and we are different because we have different kind of values. So we are Taiwanese because we believe in things like communities. And you can find the exact same power in Ukraine as well. Right? All that sense of who they are, and more importantly, also, if you look at the Taiwanese example, this has a lot to do also with their history in terms of human rights. Three minutes left to talk about human rights. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank you. Don't call it. This has to do with the fact that for a very, very long time, right? if we look at Taiwan, it's a migrant community. And to a certain extent, the Russian, uh, the, the, that relationship that Ukraine has with Russia, well, they go back and forth, they go back and forth, right? 
But in Taiwan, right, there's this distinct identity of who they are. It's tied in very closely to the kinds of um, to the kinds of things that the, the, the traumatic past that they have experienced, just like the Ukrainians. In what sense? In a sense, right, that uh, from 1950s up until the late 1980s, right, they had possibly the longest martial war anywhere in the world. 30 over years, up until 1989. How long was martial law in the Philippines? 20 years. None, none of the other students are telling you this. Does anybody, do you, you know, right? Guys, <laughs> my beloved future of the Philippines, young leaders, 20 years of martial law. All right? So they have this way of telling themselves that we are Taiwanese also because of that period of suffering that we went through. So this is what's really fascinating if you look at these two cases. And something also, if you look at if you use this model, is that it's, it's something that we can even you know, apply in terms of how we look at it. How do you guys for your identity, right, in terms of looking at the impact of martial law, the way people in the Philippines think about it, the way people in the Philippines think about their own sense of democracy, right? Okay, uh, I just I didn't take up I didn't too much more time, so I'm just gonna leave it here, and I welcome any questions. In one minute left, I welcome any questions later in the yeah. session. So thank you very much. Very much, Dr. Yo. So, our uh, second speaker uh, is a guest lecturer at the National University of Singapore, Singapore Management University, Singapore University of Technology and Design. He's uh, currently a curator at the Army Museum of Singapore, overseeing the curatorial content and artifacts of the museum for the entire army. He is uh, regularly invited to speak on national education issues in primary and secondary schools on behalf of the Singaporeans who offer and birth since 2005. He teaches courses on visual art education in the use and galleries, anthropology, uh, introduction to sociology, contemporary Singapore society, ethnicity, and ethnic relations. He graduated from the National University of Singapore with a degree on Doctor of Philosophy. He has also pursued graduate studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, University of London, and a bachelor's degree in archaeology, minor in anthropology, from the University of Western Australia. He has an extensive experience in curating galleries and museums in Singapore, and as a content manager, a researcher in several government institutions. So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Dan Tan. Hi. Um, because we are saying it's more. Um, I just want to say I've had four vaccine shots, <laughs> and I've had COVID in April. So if you can catch it for me, it would be a good one. <laughs> um, my name is Danny. Uh, my surname is Taran, but not from the billionaire family from the Um I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thanks for making me sound a lot more impressive than I think I can share. My research interest is in Malaysia, and I was looking at the ethnic minorities in Malaysia, in particular a tribal group that live in Sarawak, which is one of the states in Malaysia. Um, but you can't look at the ethnic position of a minority unless you understand how they are positioned vis-a-vis the majority group. So today I've been asked to say something about the Malays who are the majority in Malaysia. So quickly, uh, just usually when I start a lecture with a new group, I'll say that, oh, if I speak too fast, let me know. But I just realized nobody speaks faster than 50 minutes. Can you stop and listen to how 50 you guys speak and 70 in Tagalog? Whoa. Okay. Um, 
How many of you uh, have been to the race? Really? Students? Uh, it's the, the religion to leave in uh, Asia video that you saw just now. It's uh, how the state wants to show you what Malaysia looks like. It looks like everyone is dressed up for Halloween. <laughs> everyone is in a costume, right? So that, that's why we said here with how uh, visual representation and how the uh, state owned actors and also the self as agency in projecting what they look like vis a vis who they want to be or who they want to see as. Okay, so I've got about um, 60 slides. I think I think 30 minutes would be way more than enough for me. So I'll try to rush through. Next, please. Um, you can't talk about this region without talking about colonialism. So one of the ideas that is that ethnicity in this uh, region is, you cannot say ethnicity, the, the, the idea of ethnic identities didn't exist before the Spanish or the Portuguese or the Dutch or the British came. But when these guys came, they had a lot of influence in how people started to see themselves. Largely because a lot of these colonial masters needed ways to administer the new regions that they took control of. And one of the things that they did very well, that the British did very well, not so sure about the, British, uh, the Spanish and the Dutch, but the British love to document things. Some of the most boring books in the world are written by the British. <laughs> the history of the potato, uh, the history of earthworms in the Bakawa region. They, they, they will write things like that because why? Not because many of them are quite boring. But that the colonial mindset is I, the colonist, is better than who you are. And it's not just because I have a blonde hair and blue eyes, but one of the reasons that I'm better than you is I know where you live better than you. You don't know how many crabs you have. You don't know how many times of treat you have. So if I codify the knowledge of the, the things around me, it gives me authority to say that I'm better than you because I know you better than you. So besides earthworms and fish and crabs and trees and rocks, they also classify people, obviously, right? So um, next piece. Uh, next piece. Okay, so this is a colonization map. Uh, one of the only uh, countries in Southeast Asia that were not formally colonized is Thailand. So you, you must have studied that. But again, Thailand is an interesting uh, example because they were not colonized because they were contested between the French and the British because they were sandwiched right to Next piece. Next piece. Um, I often ask students, did colonialism leave you anything good? And usually, I, I have students from Vietnam uh, who will tell me that the French left me nothing good at all. The French left us nothing good. So I said, French coffee is pretty good. Your <laughs> ban me French forget. <laughs> You see, we, we, we try to think of colonialism as bad and what we are today is good, right? But we cannot be really linked. So part of what I want to talk about today is Malay identity and how it affects uh, how we understand uh, Malaysian politics and identity formation. Next please. Okay, next please. Next please. Okay, so um, in this one, I think. This is when I was an uh, undergraduate, my professor taught me this is a simple way to think about what the colonists tried to do anywhere in the world, yeah, Africa, South America, is the three G's of colonization. The colonizers wanted gold, it's not just physical gold, but wealth for themselves. So sometimes it is gold, but other, other times it's uh, the things that they could exploit and sell, either to, uh, back home or to sell to the people around to make money to, to send home. So gold, uh, it could be timber, it could be mineral and oil. Um, all the colonists wanted to spread the idea of wealth because it's a very simple idea that we are here not just to rob you of your gold, but we want to save your soul. In exchange, we're going to save your soul. All of you heathens are condemned to hell. And I have come with God and you shall be saved. Be thankful while I rob you blind, right? So that's it, in exchange. And glory. A lot of the colonization was not because uh, just gold and uh, God, but the idea that in, in Europe at that point in time, people hundred years ago, there was a great contestation of which European country is better than the other. So they all tried 
So you can imagine sitting down the few years ago and then looking at a map of the world and going, like, oh, this place, the French don't have it, the Portuguese have to come here. Oh, let's go there. It's our first time. Largely that's how the, the Dutch came to, to, to Indonesia, or how the French came to French in China. Because they, they, they saw that the British were there, so well, if nobody is there, you can play it. Next one. Thanks, 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 thanks. So part of what I'm thinking about is uh, this post-colonial studies. Yeah? So most of you should have read uh, Edward Said and the idea that um, post-colonial uh, analysis is something that has been ongoing for a long time. The, old, the idea of the other, the othering, yeah? that um, the image of the exotic uh, orient has always been around. And these ideas have been implanted so deeply that if all of you, if I just a thought experiment, if I just ask you to imagine an Igorot person from who lives in Zambia, imagine in your picture, picture a person who's an Igorot. How many of you see someone in tribal clothes? Most of you, because you mean Igorot don't wear shirts and pants and shoes? They do, but when we think of Igorot, the idea is they have been encapsulated in the idea that this is the way they have been classified. And this is the way that they have been remembered, and even till today. So a lot of the, the Malaysia, truly Asia, uh, advertisement in the beginning, the video, shows you the idea that we are all ethnic actors, yeah? we're all wearing costumes when we have to behave. But otherwise, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, we are who we are. We are the jeans and t-shirts, yeah? and, and, and expensive uh, track suits. If you haven't read this, this must Read for students like yourself. Thanks, please. So, um, they, when the colonists came to different parts of the world, what, what, what are some of the, the first things they did was to classify the people. And in the prevailing um, wisdom of the time, uh, people were classified as if they were earthworms and crabs, that there were differences that we can observe. And a lot of times there are differences that we can measure. So the cranial measurement is, is one of those things that people did to, to define who is more intelligent. So obviously, if you look at from left to right, uh, the white man is uh, has a face that uh, is more refined and more intelligent. And at the far right is an African man whose face is, is slightly different. And therefore, they cannot be as similar as you. Okay, uh, similar to the, the picture. You can see the top left on the right picture, the top left hand corner, it looks like a Greek god, right? Beautiful nose and all. But when you come right to the bottom, you can see the African man, uh, the second row third, is almost looking like an ape, right? And this is the way that they are thought of, the, the way you look, your physical characteristics, you find partly your intelligence and who you are in the social order of, of things. And um, in, in Asia, we, we do have this idea that a lot of the books that were published at that point in time were in Europe. And this is how people of the Orient, I feel like the word Orient, yeah. the people of the Orient are still imagined to look like. We look either very sexy, like the ladies, the Arab ladies, lying very uh, in a relaxed manner or on a cushion, looking as if, I don't know, they. They're just taking breaks from the like, Instagram. <laughs> or usually men look very dangerous. Women are sexualized. Men are ten minutes, and uh, men are uh, uh, not sexualized, but men look dangerous. So we are uh, colonized men like us are dangerous to white women who may have come with their husbands to, to the colonies. I need to move to the Malay section. Okay. What is Malaitas? Um, this in this region, I think it's not just Malaysia, but uh, in the south of the Philippines, there are people who still identify with uh, Malay. It's a very strange term because um, the Malay language, the Malay people existed since before the British came, but um, it was not as widespread an identity as what we have today in Malaysia. Uh, the Malay language or versions of the Malay language has been used in this region for a few hundred years as the language of the market. Right? Uh, if when traders were to move around, they would learn 
uh, different versions of Malay portrayed in even uh, the Spanish, the early Portuguese who came spoke different kinds of Malay for, for administrative and training points. So the idea of Malayness is not something new, but So this is, uh, if you're a Singapore Malaysian student, this is uh, Sir Stanford Raffles. Uh, he is uh, the founder of Modern Day Singapore. Right? In 1819, he came, uh, he saw that Singapore was not contested by the Dutch, and he saw reason to set up a training court there. And in the, he is he's a very <coughs> controversial person. Uh, he had been said to have done good, but uh, if you read a bit more about him, just like all white colonists, he had his own agenda. And a lot of it had to do with money and control and administration. So when the British came, next thing. When the British came, okay, so in, um, the British like to classify things, and what they did for uh, the human populations was a census. The census is when the government counted how many people there were uh, in under the areas we control. In 1921, for example, in British Malaya, you can see that all every white word there is a racial, ethnic, slash uh, language group that the British classified. Now, but the problem with when you classify, when you ask people who they are, and they tell you I'm Javanese, I'm from Minakabao, I'm Catholic, I'm not. People didn't think of themselves as Indian, for example. They will say, oh, I came from South India and I speak Tamil. I came from, I come from North India and I speak Hindi. So these are all different groups that people thought about before the idea that all oh, Indianness uh, unified all of us. The problem with asking people who they are is that they need to be administered as a separate group from someone who says Tamil speaking from, let's say, Hindi speaking, right? The British were very good at simplifying the census so that the groups got smaller and smaller. Imagine you had to administer 100 groups of student groups in, in FEU today, which is complicated, but if I simplify it to 10 groups, it's easier, right? I only have to find 10 groups and speak to 10 student leaders as opposed to 100. So over time, the British simplified the idea of Malayness. So when, you, when people were asked by the British uh, in the early 1900s, who, who you are, very few said they were Malay. Most people said, I were, I'm from Java. Right? I'm uh, from Minakabau. These are different parts of uh, Indonesia. But it's, uh, I'm from Bali. But over time, uh, people were encouraged or, uh, either by the census or by uh, learning the language in school that they are Malay. So today, if you ask Malaysians, many people will say, that, yes, I'm Malay. But actually, if you ask them, oh, no, 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 where's your mother from? Oh, my mother is from Minakabau. Oh, my father is from Madura in Java. But actually, today, I am Malay. Right, so this is a simplification of something very complicated. Okay, um, in the American constitution, it goes we the people, right? And in many constitutions of the world, I including the Philippines, I believe, uh, constitutions don't talk about differences. They talk about we the people, we are one, right? The Malaysian constitution is one of the few in the world where people are classified with different. Think about that. A constitution that doesn't bring people together, but to say, oh, we are different. So in the constitution, the Malay person has a specific identity and criteria to be Malay. So to be Malay, these are the three type criteria to be Malay. Yeah? One is you must belong to a Malayan race. Okay, that means you identify to be Malay. You speak the Malay language, and you are Muslim. You subscribe to Islam the religion. So these are the main three criteria. So you can see over time, it's very easy for a different group of people in Malaysia to self-identify with Malay. Because you only have three things. You, you identify as Malay, you speak the language, and you're Muslim. Right? So it, it's a, a very simplified way of thinking about Malayness. And while this constitution is written by the Malaysian people for themselves, right? But you can see that a lot of the ideas were passed down from the British times. So one of the things I want to think about is in post-colonialism, lots of us want to say, oh, the British were not good for us, they exploited us, you know, da, 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 and therefore we want to move away. In Singapore, we say that too. But I say that to you in English language. 
right? They have left me in English. They have left me in English education that I am then using to denounce the English colonialism. That is sad, right? So I think self-realization is more important. So this this is what I want, what you you guys to think about because um, one of the things I, I quickly uh, with my few trips to uh, the Philippines and a few Philippine uh, Filipino friends that I had. I think race and identity is slightly different in, in the Philippines, right? Do you, do you think of yourself as different races and ethnic groups in the Philippines? Or you're more closely identified with region, identity, regional? Which island you're from? And Catholicism is one, and the other would be the Muslims in the South, right? So I don't know whether, I, I, I'm asking a question maybe that some of the students can share with me later. Is this because the Spanish thought of race and identity slides in a slightly different manner than how the British thought about race and identity? Yeah, so if you think about that, maybe you can have a good discussion. Uh, a good lecture is when I learn something from you, other than I just tell you things that I think. Okay, um, so I think I have three minutes. Okay. Um, when the British came and they started, um, another book to read is interesting, is by J.S. Furnival, if you are looking at uh, colonial ethnic identities. He's a British uh, officer who was working in Burma today is uh, Denmark. And he made a very interesting observation that in many of these um, colonial towns and cities, they were actually created by business, by colonial business, for people to congregate, to come and buy and sell things, right? So Bernabal observed that many of these towns and cities in Myanmar, but they go across uh, British India, uh, British Malaya, and Singapore, that while they are called plural societies, so in Singapore we thought, think of ourselves as plural societies, because we're made up of different uh, race, ethnicities, languages, religions, right? But actually, the plurality is usually seen only in the marketplace. In the daytime, when people come together to trade in the market, we are plural. We are Igorot, we are Kalina, we are Tedalo. We all come together and we buy and sell things at the marketplace and port, usually. But think about that. When the trading is over and the sun sets and you go home, you don't go home to a plural society, do you? You go back to a village full of Igorot people. The next village is full of Kalina. The next village is full of, full of Tedalo. So the idea is that colonialism falsely creates the idea that we are plural, but yet actually we are still self-identifying with whatever identity markers that we think are important. Okay. Next. So um, the British left this idea with the, the Malayan society when they got independence in 1957. Uh, Malayans wrote their own uh, uh, constitution that then solidified this idea that different races are uh, uh, in a plural society in Malaysia they had to exist together. But in somehow of a, it's called a social contract. The Malays are the majority. The Malays in Malaysia make up 65, 66%. They are the majority, but they have to accommodate the relatively large minority of 40% uh, who are the Chinese, the Indians, and a lot of the smaller tribal groups. So one of the more uncomfortable things they had to do was, oh, we had to give citizenship to the Chinese in Malaya because they are one of us, but we are slightly different because you are not. Uh, the Chinese is not Pendaka, which is someone who has just arrived in Malay, rather than uh, the Malayans who have been there, supposedly the Malays who have supposedly been there. Um, okay, next. Next. The Japanese also helped solidify this identity because the Japanese favored the Malays they, they were not comfortable with the Chinese because of the war in China. So the Chinese in Malaysia were not trusted. So they trusted the Malays for, and the Malays took on a lot of the administrative posts that the British officers were sent to jail. A lot of the Malays became the administrators of uh, Japanese occupied. So, okay, I, I, I can never get through this in 20 minutes. I like to be very. So today, Malaysia is a Malaysia truly Asia is a melting pot of different uh, race is a very uh, when I teach race and ethnicity, I always tell the, the students that race is about who you look like. Ethnicity is about what you do. 
So usually when I say race and ethnicity, I mean ethnicity, right? not just the way you look, because Filipinos don't have one look, but you can identify with your ethnic a marker such as, I don't know, eating balloon or adobo. <laughs> adobo. Yeah, yeah. All right. So um, I think I have to leave it here, but uh, the question I left you with, I would like to have a quick discussion. How do Filipinos think about race and ethnicity? And where do you think these ideas come from? If these ideas are weak, why are they weak? If they are strong, why are they strong? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much to our esteemed guest speakers, Dr. Marian Leong and Dr. Dan Dan. Let us again give them a round of applause. <laughs> so, sir, I would like to give the floor to our actors for today. Mr. Nathan Go, a faculty member of the Political Science Department, and Ms. Susan Kirby, a faculty member of the International Studies Department. To facilitate this discussion in open forum, May also invite Mr. Jules Arceo of the International Studies Department. May I invite our guest speakers, our actors, and our moderators to the floor, please? Uh, good morning, everyone. Now we are proceeding to uh, hearing the reactions from the two uh, reactors for this morning. We will start with uh, Mr. Nathan uh, from the Political Science Department. Thank you very much. Um, I first like to respond or to react to uh, the talk by Dr. Leon. He actually raises two very important points that we have to remember as as Asian, as a country, as we are in a country, are in the same region as Asia. First and foremost, we have to remember that history really does matter. As students of conflict or students are interested in conflict and international relations, we really have to be reminded that these things do not exist in vacuums. In other words, we have to consider the context under which they exist in. We cannot simply look at the present day conflicts in Ukraine. We can simply look at the present day conflicts in Taiwan and say that these are just what they are. We have to consider where do these countries come from and what are their past conflicts with each other. Because to simply look at conflicts that they are is actually very ignorant and very, and uh, I would like to take the thing not very long for being able to frame that conflict into its context. The second is uh, the issue of human rights. And certainly, as Filipinos, we are, I mean, even our own administration right now, or previous administrations, tend to have a complicated relationship with defining or even accepting human rights. Not long ago, we've had political officials who would say that human rights is a Western concept. Then maybe, the UN Declaration is certainly because we know the history of the United Nations. But certainly, the underlying ideas about human rights that humans as human beings have the right to a life, to liberty, certainly these are not simply Western ideals. Certainly, a human being that lives, a human being that has an identity as established, certainly that is not a Western concept. So, to the second um, topic by Dr. Tano, as a former colony, it's a little bit complicated for us as well to think or even discuss colonialism. Um, we have to remember that colonial legacies cast many long shadows in our own society. In fact, in as much as uh, we see the, leg the colonial legacy of the British on Malaysia, a lot of our political problems in the Philippines are actually rooted in American occupation. The 
because colonialism, if you look at it, is considered to be a critical juncture that creates fact dependent trajectories. In other words, what I'm saying is things in the past affect today. We can trace a lot of the problems, we can trace a lot of the realities of today by looking at our past. Thank you, Mr. Dinkan. Now, um, let's give the floor to uh, Ms. Susan for her reality. Um, thank you very much for the talk, Professor Tan and Professor Leong. I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Uh, one of the things that nobody tells you when you start teaching is that you stop learning and listening to such um, interesting ideas. So I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to listen to you. Um, and I, I thought it was very interesting how your talks, both of them sort of uh, viewed national identity from very different perspectives. It was very interesting because the first talk emphasized national unity, national identity in Taiwan, right? Whereas with Professor Tan, you actually talked about the diversity and how this national identity is in fact a colonial construct. So it's very interesting to hear these constructs with um, juxtapose or juxtapose of these ideas and uh, hopefully we'll get to um, hear more about the thoughts uh, during the q and session. Uh, as for me, I have uh, a few observations as well as some questions. I will start with a uh, an observation for uh, Professor Tan. You mentioned you asked, uh, about the view of colonization, whether it's viewed favorably or unfavorably colonizers have left us with anything good or not. And my argument, and I would love to hear what you think about this, is that colonization is viewed favorably or not, depending on the country's current socioeconomic status. So from my personal observation, I would say that, at least let me know what you think. I would say that uh, Singapore relatively has a peaceful view has sort of reconciled with its colonial past. Uh, the British are not viewed in a very negative way. I'm trying to be provocative here, so <laughs> he's letting out find my ball. Um, and I would say that there is a very strong identification with anything British, British education, the royal family, the culture, even uh, a, a, a a very sort of prominent colonizer that you yourself mentioned, uh, Raffles, is somebody who's celebrated. We have fancy hotels, schools, et cetera, right? Who are named after Raffles. And this is something that for me as a Filipino and half Middle Eastern, I look at this and it's baffling because I think our relationship with colonization, especially the Middle Eastern part, is quite different. So that is my argument. I think the current socioeconomic status, that probably applies to Malaysia as well. Uh, it's an upper, higher level, uh, middle income country that is doing well. And I see that this, the relationship is more or less um, reconciled when it comes to colonization. So that's my argument. Uh, my question would be, why do you think from your research, the Malaysian state has played along with the British and the Japanese and uh, sort of emphasized the oneness of the Malay uh, ethnicity. I mean, there are certainly economic benefits to it, uh, but I would love to hear you more. Now, for Professor Nyon, uh, I will play the devil's advocate here, and I would say that uh, in response to your I, your thoughts on what what is the source of resistance for Taiwan, what keeps them going in spite of uh, in the event that there is a war on Taiwan. The likelihood of the country to survive, especially relying on military uh, resources, is is not very good. Let's say. Um, I, I, what I would say is that well, isn't resistance irrational to begin with, in terms of cost of human life, infrastructure, etc. Uh, isn't our revolutions romanticized after all uh, and exploited by the political elite? I mean, the idea of a national identity is a social construct, a very recent one at that. When you look at things like uh, the Taiwan flag, national anthem, and the Philippines, for example, we even have national flowers, national animal, etc. All of these are, are social constructs and are very recent, and they do serve, first and foremost, the political elite. So why risk our lives in a pretty much a futile resistance? 
So these are my questions. I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Susan. Uh, now we need the floor to uh, our speakers to respond to all the reactions. Uh, Dr. Dan? Now I'll finish my two hour lecture. <laughs> okay, um, Raffles came to Singapore in 1819, uh, February, when he signed an agreement with the local ruler for the right for the British East India Company to set up a trading post. Um, think about this year, it's 2022. So, three years ago, we sent we marked 200 years of the coming of Raffles, the Stanford Raffles in Singapore. In many places of the world, um, the day of the coming of the colonies is not celebrated, right? You can think of Australia 1788. Um, they do have Australia Day that they celebrate, but many people despise Australia Day because it's exactly the same day that Aborigines were ill-treated by the white settlers. So in Singapore, it's very strange. In 2019, three years ago, we actually celebrated the 200th anniversary of the colonization of Singapore. How many countries can you say we were happy to celebrate our own colonization? <laughs> but this is who we are in Singapore. We have the things, okay, um, in the Southeast Asian Studies Department, we always make fun that the Portuguese were the most excellent colonizers in the event. The Spanish um, were the most brutal. The Dutch were the most exploitative. The British were the least evil of all. Right? So the British has left Singapore with the language, which is our economic power today. Many people do business in Singapore because simply because of the language. But not just that, that our education system, our legal system is in sync with many of the hundred of the Commonwealth countries like that. Thanks, British country. So it's, it's a place, Singapore is in a place where we like, when it's time for, to elect uh, politicians, some of them like to say, oh, we shouldn't do what the British did to us because they exploited us. But in many cases, we are made to think that we should be more thankful about colonization. Yes. So I, I like, uh, and Singaporeans usually don't come across as humble because we, in Southeast Asia, we are seen to be. We lost duty because we have F1. F1 is this week? Yeah. That's why I'm here. Second question I want to address is why did the Malay majority play along with the British and the Japanese? If we now know that this is the, uh, a false aggregation of little ethnic groups to, to, form, uh, to form a larger Malay identity, why? But my question is simple is if I were to give you power, why would you not make it for me? Right? There's many psychological experiments where people are given power. Uh, there's this movie with the, the Stanford experiment with the electricity shock. Humans will say that they don't want to exploit others until they're given the chance to. So the Malays are in the same position. They were given the government, the British, would before they left, said we want to leave Malaysia in the hands of the majority people in the Malays. And they help set up the institutions that allow the Malays to gain the government. So, for example, uh, in the Malay constitution, the uh, Malaysian constitution, uh, there's no promise of who, which person, which ethnicity, which race, which religion would be the prime minister of the country, but no one will ever dare suggest that a non Malay, non Muslim would become prime minister. Because that would be ethnic violence. Yeah? So, it's, it's something served up on a platter. Uh, and just the last point is, think of it as internal colonialism. Colonialism is not just something that finished when the British, the, the Dutch, and the French left Southeast Asia. The idea that the people in power were able to subjugate people who are less powerful is still with us today. The Malays practice the very same thing that they say that the British were wrong in doing. So, for example, the Malays. Uh, the, the smallest minorities in Malaysia are like the Ikugao, the Igorot groups, they are the Negritos. They are the, they call Orang Asli in Malaysia. Only number of 300,000. These were the people here before anybody came to yeah? The British exploited everyone, of course, including the Orang Asli. You would think that with post-colonial um, 
epiphany that we're raised with God, like, no, no, no. We need to treat everyone better because we were not treated before. The Malays still exploit the Quranas today using the very same institutional structures and powers left to them by the British. So, this is something that we never learned. We blame, it's easy to blame the white man and the woman for the things of the world, but look at who we are when we're dealing with ourselves. Some of us, we, are, we may not be white, but we may be the elites of society that are behaving in the exact same ways that we are chastising the colonizers for having done in the past. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. I think um, uh, Dr. Tan was able to uh, elaborate on what Ms. Susan was pointing out earlier, that when it comes to colonialism, we simply cannot look at it from one perspective. Okay? It's um, amazing how um, we get to see that um, our perception of colonialism also depends on the circumstances we are in. Okay? So um, I think now we can uh, hear from uh, Dr. Yong. Uh, pretty apt on um, uh, what are you after? Thank you very much. What are you just here? Yeah, this is part of this. Start of that. <laughs> this is for the grand. <laughs> I'll do it some people. Um, I, 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 I don't know how many of you know this, right? But I'm actually, so, so I, I've taken a lot of issues with, uh, with what he says. So I'm trying to answer this question. There, there, um, I mean, Danny, you know, Danny has made some really good and very salient things. Uh, he's, he's made some very good and very salient things. But one of the things I think also right, in reference to your question about how compliant you know, the Malays was was linked to both the Japanese and the British, right? And hopefully I'll be able to go back to Malaysia and I say this. Is that, is that there was also a, a strain of thought that existed in Malaya at the time, in which there were people who, kind of like the NPA here, uh, they were striving for a more equal society within Malaysia, or within Malaya at that point in time. And there's that, that, that part of history in Malaya right, that was kind of wiped out because it says, you know, Malaya or Malaysia came about as one specific political party that uh, catered only to one specific ethnicity or, or ethnic group or race. So it's not entirely true because there were people who were against the Chinese, who were against the British, and who were against the way in which things were institutionalized in Malaya and in Malaysia. Um, on the issue of irrationality. I love that word. It's absolute. Now, one of the points that I want you guys to, to take away from today, right, is that irrationality is good. Irrationality is needed. Okay, I'll bring in a couple of things. So, so if we look at Singapore, right, everyone thinks that Singapore is so perfect and it's the whole thing and it's all cool and all that. Then there is a minority group of Malay who are not okay. Okay, there are a group of ethnic minority Malay people in Singapore who look at us people and they say, what the hell? Also, not just looking at people like him, but also questioning, look, before the white man came along, right, we had our own history. Before the Spanish came along, there was a native aid which you guys wrote, right? Uh, uh, the Baila. If I'm, if, I'm not, uh, if I'm not mistaken, right? So, so going back to the issue of that balance, so this is what I want to talk about. And then there is a certain level of resistance coming to those people. And that's how I want to make that connection to whether we talk about the Ukrainians, whether we talk about the Taiwanese, or whether we talk about anybody else. Like, okay, what if we kind of take the term that you use, irrationality, great word, right? And we also say, look, in that sense, right, and I'll probably not be able to go to China anymore after this, are the Chinese also, to a certain extent, irrational? Right? Okay. So, so if they are, how are they irrational? Look at the, the, the levels of nationalism that exists in China right now. Right? 
this is, at, at one point, on one hand, this is a military strategic issue. On the other hand, this has a lot to do with this thing of means. In, as far as Chinese culture is concerned, which is, a big, which is the issue of space, right? It's like, oh my God, Taiwan, they're saying that you're, a, you're you want to be an independent country. That's a slap in my face, right? So to that extent, right, that's that when, when, when we talk about identity politics, it is extremely irrational. It doesn't make sense whatsoever. So on one part, we've got irrationality happening in the world. And on the other part, yes, there is a lot of irrationality in Taiwan, especially when you look at this the space. Family politics, bento boxes, why not the base, pulling hair, so so we look at uh Taiwanese identity, we, 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 we inject the issue of irrationality. It makes nationalism, national identity, identity politics, these things are very dangerous precisely because they are irrational. Right? And of course, we talk about politics, we have to be an anti-rational the lesson as much as possible, the damage which probably will be in the third year of the So the Taiwanese, or at least Taiwanese identity, like I won't I say all Taiwanese, but Taiwanese identity for a very, very long time has been suppressed. So you look at the flag of the Republic of China, not the first Republic of China, but the Republic of China, it is actually the flag that is taken from the main political party that gave the to what we call modern Taiwan. Right, like kind of like the uh, that is, but that's that represents a political party that caters to a specific uh, demography in Taiwan, right? And these people are often considered to be more pro China, but there's a great sense of people on the island who are becoming more and more identifying themselves with Taiwan itself, but they, in terms of their identity and in terms of how they express it, are always to a certain extent they can only express it so far and then everything stops because there's things you have to think about about how track is going to attack blah 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 so this is it's it's a when we talk about identity it's 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 been placed in the pressure cooker for such a long time that no one wants to take advantage that no one wants to take pay attention to that it's slowly bumbling down and so I think one of the ways in, in which we can actually avoid this conflict is that we say the PRC refuses to recognize Taiwan as a sovereign state. And not just, you know, and go beyond it. If they don't want to do that, I think to that extent also, and this is also something for the PRC to think about, is that they, they should at least be able to recognize Taiwan as having its own separate identity. Because China is not just one thing by itself. It's made up of different groups, different regions, right? So people in Xinjiang, so many issues. We've got issues in Tibet. We've got issues in all the other different parts of China. So if 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 they were if they were able to just take that into consideration, at the very least, there the Taiwanese people think there is a recognition of who you are, at least of that side, who you will understand us. And I think. In that sense, right, it could also ameliorate the tensions which exist in the straight, straight channel. That's the thing, that's the, I, I think the biggest thing is in terms of this conflict side, all these smaller dynamics right, are totally important. Right? If there was only enough time and effort spent into understanding the local dynamics which is happening at this point in time, then maybe people would react in a more rational way. Towards the kinds of irrationality which is existing on both sides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Erdogan. Um, I do agree that uh, a sense of rationality isn't really so bad. Most of the time, when we see we act because of reason, we overlook that you know there are things that cannot simply be solved by reason. And as Dr. Yong mentioned, the conflict in Taiwan perhaps can be resolved if we learn how to mix our rationality with our irrationality as well. Okay. So for um, I have one uh, question for both our speakers and of course for our reactors as well. Um, for the past hour, we've been talking about the importance of identity, strengthening a sense of identity, but um, somehow. Um, I think it's important for us to also realize that um, a sense of identity is not static. 
once it's established, it can still be them. Can you please give us um, insights as to what can weaken or harm um, a nation's sense of identity? Um, perhaps you can start with uh, Dr. Dan. <laughs> okay, I come from Singapore. <laughs> and I'm Chinese. Uh, I was an anthropology student and a graduate. One of the things I learned and I'm still humbled by it is reflexivity. The idea that you must always, no anthropologist can be just a recording machine and be objective about everything he or she sees or learns or talks about. It. So I need to be aware that I am, by now I don't apologize, but I am of the majority. Race in Singapore. And um, okay, that's the other one. But my point about Singapore is everything is fine when the economy is doing well. Think about that. We talk about all these small things, right? But if you go home where you have Wi Fi, you can watch your Netflix, you have some money left in the pocket, you know, to, to, to go and have Jolly Bee. Um, when you graduate, you have a job that will pay you enough to pay your basic bills and start a family or go travel to Singapore or Malaysia to have a look. All that is fine. All the little things about religion, about internal politics, right? About two hour traffic jams that take you 20 minutes to walk, they don't really matter. But the, when the shit hits the fan, it's when the economy fails. And this that's why if you're looking at the news in this past few months. The, the word, the two words, global recession is moving. It's very scary. When people are struggling at the economic level, they will do things that will accentuate the differences in ethnicity and religion to race. So I think that that would be my main concern. But I live in Singapore, and we have <laughs> by 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 all measures. Uh, people in Singapore, you know, they count how much money a country has in terms of billions of trillions. China has more money in the Singapore. If you go by uh, the, in the bank account, you have a foreign exchange bank account. China has 1.4 billion people. I have 5 million people that have trillions of dollars. So Singapore has enough money to, to weather the storms that we have. But one of the things that we cannot control is Singapore has 5 million people. Surround, uh, of Chinese majority, uh, surrounded by 300 over million Muslims in this region. So no matter how rich we are, uh, I, I, my introduction, I was, uh, you, they mentioned I'm uh, from the Army Museum. So the same point is an army. What is there to be fed? Yes, we, uh, we are the, in terms of equipment, we are the most powerful army in Southeast Asia, but not in terms of manpower, the soldiers. But what are we going to defend? Right? It's just like uh, Dr. Leon will look at me in a very mean way. What, <laughs> if China decides to be rational, what is there for Taiwan to defend? 1.4 million billion people, and Taiwan has 28 million. Billion versus million. So if I just got all the Chinese to swim across the Taiwan to invade, Taiwan would run out of ammunition to kill everyone, and then all the Chinese will still get to Taiwan to invade. So um, the, the, my point is, if you ask me, the differences that we face on a daily basis don't become dangerous until much bigger forces come to play. Economics is one. And the other one I think Dr. Lam pointed out is ethno nationalism. That when Chinese people feel very strongly about something, they can be very irrational. I was in uh, Shanghai a few years ago, and China has always been fighting over the small islands, including the Philippines, right? The Arasals and right? uh, the, the smaller little outcrops, who don't really mean much except that they are territorial extensions of your country. They, they may not be good for a holiday or for oil or gas, but it says Philippines is now bigger because we have small islands further from us than we claim. Um, one of the things that will be dangerous is if China decides that um, Taiwan is part of China and there's no reason why we can allow it to be separated. So that irrationality may cause lots of people to die, but that would be the elites deciding that the death of a common soldier is collateral damage 
or what is needed on the ethno nationalistic front. So I think that would be what is irrational that would be very dangerous. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, before we proceed to Dr. Young, is it okay, sir, if I give the mic to uh, Ms. Susan? Ms. Susan wants to ask a question uh, to Dr. Danny. I think Dr. Danny said something that you know, triggered her. Let's give the floor to Ms. Susan. I hope it's not because I said shit in the bed. It's a very American saying that makes it possible. No, not at all. I'm actually just curious from your perspective. Um, so out of the uh, so-called Asian traders or developmental states, uh, and let's not include Hong Kong for a second here because that's very good. Uh, Singapore is the one country whose political system is, and uh, there's different variations of this, but not quite all the way to the right? Yeah. Um, how sustainable is this regime, do you think, the PIP? How long can they keep the political stability and the sort of what seems to be a kind of transition of power from one member to another of the same political party? Very curious to hear that. So Singapore became independent in 1965 from the British, uh, one of the political parties that contested in the first election, the People's Action Party, is still in power today, since 1965. So when Susan says that it's not almost democratic, it's true. But we have always had free and fair elections. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Verified by the United Nations. This is not just as they But there's a lot of political intimidation. So for example, someone like me may feel like I'm in a position to join an opposition party in Singapore, right? I, I'm opinionated, I'm educated, I'm Travel the world, and I think I can do a bit better for Singapore as an alternative voice in Parliament, right? But I don't want people spying on what I serve on the internet at night. I don't want people to figure out what I do in TV, talking to developmental and political science students. Am I right? trying to make Singapore better? You see, it is not so that our elections are free and fair, but the idea is that in Singapore, it's, it's the same idea. Why rock the boat? Why go against what is currently working? If the PAP in Singapore gives us, have you been to Singapore on F1B? It's crazy, you know, it's like party, drinking, there are free concerts, it's, it's just for a whole week, and then there's fireworks every other night. These are the things that our compliance, our obedience to the government is giving us. That we are able to be global citizens with enough pocket money to, to enjoy the trappings of modernity, to have a bit of wealth left over to travel the world. And all the government needs from us is, okay, there are a few things, work hard, have lots of babies because our population is coming, and always vote for the incumbent PAP party. But things are changing. Uh, for the longest time, there have been very, very few. We have Eight zero seats in parliament. You know, we're a very small country, 18, of which there used to be zero opposition up to the 1982. Zero opposition. And then well, slowly there was one, there was two, there was five. And now I think we have 10. 10 out of 18 is not a lot, but it is still something that the PAP is thinking about. One day we may have to transition to a new government, and what happens? when an inexperienced political party that has won political power, but has never handled a billion trillion dollar economy, how are they going to do it? So this is one of those things I think about as a same point. The things that I take for granted, maybe partly PAP is the stability that we all need. What if in the name of freedom of speech and free and fair elections that other well-meaning Singaporeans take power in Singapore, but what if they just can't do the job of running a big country like that? So that's one of the things that, that keeps me awake at night too. Okay? Thank you. I have, uh, can you, I want you to think about this and maybe join in later. I, I, I really hope the students get, get to join in later. Is when, when I was thinking of colonialism just now in, in the Philippines, I was thinking of Spanish. It's a few hundred years, right? Yeah. But straight away, you jump in and say, oh, maybe the Americans are more influenced. I'd like to hear why you think that is the prevailing thought that American colonialism, though very short, is so much more 
important in, in thinking of post colonial Philippines than the three, four hundred years of Spanish colonization of this area. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Danny, for emphasizing the importance of uh, the economy and for giving an assignment to students to think for the next few minutes. Okay, um, before I proceed to Dr. Young, um, uh, Sir Nathan here um, whispered that he also wants to share something about Singapore. So, Sir Nathan. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to add that when you look at post colonial legacies, you know, Singapore tends to be the outlier. It tends to be, we, have, we often look at post colonies as developed countries, for example, we look at all the former colonies that Spain handled. And when you really look at Singapore and even to a certain degree, uh, Hong Kong, they tend to be the exception to the rule. But uh, I want to bring in regarding how sustainable is an authoritarian regime. Maybe the only one that's not the best word to use. But um, in, in our studies in political science, we would often say that we need democracy in order to modernize. Or rather, when you look at what the relationship between uh, modernization and politics, modernization regarding democracy. And our initial understanding is that. If a country is democratizing or you have democracy, it paves the way for economies to flourish. However, uh, recent studies have actually proven that essential modernization. Theme. So it's like we are now shifting paradigms against Western beliefs against that democracy is the best, democracy is here to stay. Um, certainly, uh, if we look at Freedom House indexes or even democratic indexes, if we would give them credit or even uh, believe them, Singapore doesn't really rank high in terms of its democratic scores. However, we could also say that in terms of its citizens, Singaporean citizens really do place a huge trust on its government. So to say that it's a matter of democracy and versus non democracy. It's a very myopic argument for me. We have to consider how do citizens look beyond paradigms of simply saying that democracy is not democracy, whether or not people have free will or not free will. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would like to say. Um, can I answer this question? Sure. About, okay. Um, you asked Spain. Yeah, about Spain and why America is much more influential. So, yes, uh, Spain was under. As Spain handled, uh, was colonized the Philippines for over 300 years, and America only a fraction of the time. However, what made American occupation a little bit more critical to how the Philippines is, it has to do with the manner in which America handled nation building versus state, uh, state building versus nation building. So, um, America, America established the three branches of government, basing it on from their own constitution. Uh, this is from you know, our very famous white man's burden that they're here to modernize the Philippines. Now. However, the problem there had to do a lot with what the political parties at the time. What happened was, um, rather than political part parties fighting for independence or fighting for the interests of national or, or Filipinos rather, because they were already in power during at the time of the Spanish, you know, the Ilustrados, they were already in party, they were already internal to the political process. Instead of fighting for independence, they rather fought with themselves for cooperation for power. So that legacy is actually still alive today. That is one, one of the main reasons why the Philippines is a weak party system actually. So just that's like one answer, the many answers to the question why American uh, on occupation plays a huge part. I'll just finish with uh, Nathan's with point about democracy. I think democracy is a great paper exercise. If you are thinking of ways to run a country, there are different things that you can put in place so that the country is run smoothly. But democracy in practice is a scary thing. If I were to ask you today, if all the, the, the senior faculty here agree, we can have a binding vote today of whether FPU students should take any examinations, yes or no. 
let's take a binding vote. How many of you want to do away with examinations just because you have finished the work and the attending classes? All of you get a higher distinction. How many of you agree that this is, should be the case? Don't be shy. <laughs> the camera is pointed at us. No exam. No, no exams exam. and higher distinction for everyone. Come in. Come on. You see, if that was a binding vote, it will send. Democratic, right? Freedom of speech. You have a right. You are in the majority. What's to stop you from doing this? To Dr. Trina, I tell her, as, as we be on FBU, we have decided we have voted internally and there shall be no exams and we shall all get A plus plus plus. So you see, democracy is scary. So I think the problem is scary. You're telling this thing. If, if this is, this man, right, is now exactly like how I think this person should be very convenient. He's basically the Duterte of it. <laughs> Like that. Like, oh, okay. So, so he, makes, he makes these very simplistic arguments. He says, the what we see is all about me giving you the chance and the opportunity to do whatever the hell you want. That is democracy. So it's like what your previous president said. Vote for me and I'll make sure that your lives will be stable, you can do your jobs and all that. You don't have to worry about crime and drugs. I'll deal with that. I'll... <laughs> okay, whatever it is you want, whether it's free KFC, no exams, you know, every day I'll give you joint feet, that's fine. You know, you have that. That's that's how he looks at the box, which I think is extremely flawed. <laughs> what, what, what is democracy? Democracy is made up of institutions. Democracy is made up of, and it, it should be considered to be a fail-safe measure to protect people against the overarching powers of the state. If you can have the PAP now, right, or whatever political party that is able to do good for now, who's to say that at some point in time, they're not going to be able to do bad as well? That's exactly the case. They, they, whatever the case, no matter how authoritarian one might accuse Singaporeans have, they still play face, or they still give face to democracy because that's how they are also able to, uh, to, 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 to create that sense of legitimacy, right? It's the same thing. So, you guys are not, they're not authoritarian, they're a semi democracy, which they still have a claim to the audience. Okay, I still have the, uh, I still have the appeared. So please don't make this mistake, which he says that, oh, yeah, this is what It's a very dangerous thing. Uh, since, <laughs> since Dr. Liao outed me as a Singaporean just now, I will always like to remind him that his PhD was completely funded by the National University of Singapore. <laughs> But it's, yeah, I can, I can see Manjula. Uh, I love the Manjula. But I also, my time in Singapore has allowed me to understand a lot of things about how to do certain things and more importantly, how not to do certain things. So, so I, I just want to kind of end this very quickly. But one of the, I, I think one of the things that they have done quite well in Singapore, at least at the institutional level, and when we talk about identity, right? Identity, nationalism, ethno-national research, it's a very irrational thing. But maybe my, my point is, is there a way that you can make thing, make this irrationality a little bit more? So I think one of the really wonderful things that oh, I'm not wonderful about one of the things that I, I think American uh, occupation of the American influence there's a sense of civic nationalism, right? That uh, so if you if you look at Spanish colonialism, right, there was a lot of emphasis in terms of the racial hierarchy, but at least in terms of what the, the American contribution, there is that greater sense that we at least right in, in terms of that more than copy from America, we will play, but we will give some credence to the term equality. So you, you shift people's attention away from the ethnic groups more than 
towards values of which people can share, right? Whether it's towards a level of state or whatever, at least towards values that people can share. So, so you know, in, in, in Singapore, they, 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 this kind of play towards equality, regardless of who you are, uh, you know, everyone's given a certain amount of opportunities and we can do it. And it's not because of the fact that it's you know, about this race or this race or whatever. Everybody is given that opportunity. And that's exactly where I think it's missing because in, in terms in terms of cutting off the edge right, that comes along that, that raises edge that comes along with national nationalism, people need to get towards something larger and bigger than their own parochial interests. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Young. And I uh, concluded with the reason that um, to somehow overcome differences in ethnicity, there are, of course, shared values that we can capitalize on. So uh, before I give the floor or open the floor to uh, our audience, I would like to uh, call Ms. Susan first for uh, some comments that she has for the doctor. Thank you very much. Um, just quickly to comment on uh, both Professor Tan and Professor Young, and again, playing the devil's advocate here, I would say that, and last time I tried this argument in Malaysia, it was not popular <laughs> among the colleagues of political scientists, but don't try it again here. I would say that there is an argument for uh, the so called uh, enlightened dictator or benign dictator. <laughs> Saying the devil's advocate, no, no, I'm not saying this is what should happen, but historically speaking, if you look at again the developmental state, the idea is that an authoritarian um, uh, regime sort of uh, they steer their economy, the economy of their countries from low levels of development towards economic growth, higher levels of development, and then when the country is rich enough, then slowly either uh, organically, or maybe a uh, top down process, it depends. Uh, one can start including more voices in the system. Uh, and we can see this happening. This happened, of course, in South Korea and Singapore. That's why I asked earlier whether maybe that's where the transition will happen. Uh, we see this happening today as well in countries like Qatar, uh, UAE, where you have a dictator. but they are working on making their countries better. Uh, and the thing is, when politically speaking, when we talk about established democracies, right? Rich, established democracies, and then dictatorships, in the middle, you have emerging democracies. And these are the most politically unstable. And so that, again, goes back to the argument that there is something to be said behind uh, the concept. I'm not saying this is what should happen. It's not, there's no um, foolproof way of doing this, but there is some evidence. So, uh, I don't know if we'll finish the conversation today. It's, it's very interesting. I'm always curious to hear your thoughts as well. And my colleagues are definitely the students. So I won't belabor the point. I just wanted to put it up. Okay. Okay, come on. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, anyone from uh, the audience wants to? Uh, raise a question, great, please. Uh, just react. Yes, I, I see your hand from uh, uh, please approach. Come here. Yeah, the camera is not waiting for you. <laughs> yes, uh, can you please introduce yourself, your major, and uh, then we will deliver your I would just like to know if um, our idea or our concept of human rights, is it affected by or was it um, change and <laughs> um, molded by uh, colonialism? Was it affected by colonialism? Okay, thank you, Cameron. Um, 
Yes, Dr. Young. So uh, when, when we look at the, the concept of human rights, right, uh, when, when we talk about it, we can, we can talk until the powers come home. But I, I think one of the things that people always, always want to right, is is the UDHR. So the UDHR is the most obvious piece evidence that shows us at, at the very least what an idea of human rights is about. Uh, the UDHR, right? Uh, 1948, which uh, was 10th of December, the Human Rights Day, right? That's why I'm right? It came about on that. The UDHR is a document that was put together by people who were brought from different geographical areas, including someone from the East Asia. The UDHR also right, has an historical antecedent in that the document uh, was, was, was written up because of that previous experience, right, of what we refer to as the Holocaust. Right. So the UDHR is a direct reaction, not just to the atrocities of the Second World War, but also to the Holocaust. And possibly also, if you look at the genocide convention, it, it also, it, if we take that to be as evidence of human rights, it has antecedents in the, the, the Armenian genocide. So if when, when someone comes up to me and says that it's a colonial thing, it's a Western thing, yeah, sure. I mean, you can say that. I mean, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was instrumental in in the in the in the, in the creating in the creation of this document. But to, to to have them say that all oh, colonialism brought us about Western people brought about no, it's the idea of human rights, the UDHR, things like the Genocide Convention, they are grounded in actual human suffering. <laughs> so so it's 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 not. I, I I think a lot of times this argument is used by people who kick you guys out of ICC and all that, you know, and that, that's a, that, that's one of the things I want to warn you guys too, right, is that sovereignty and nationalism are almost always the weapons that are used by certain individuals to say that we should not respect human rights because, you know, the ICC is going to take our sovereignty away from us, we will then not be able to judge our own, no, no, so that we have our own sovereignty, our own cause of laws, no, cannot, cannot. Right? And the, oh, it's all English law and French law, whatever. No. But the thing is, right, at, at, at the core, that what is the ICC fighting? What is the UDHR fighting? What is the genocide convention fighting? What is the ICCPR going to do? What is the ICCPR going to do? Trying to create a sense of rights, create a sense of dignity, and to ensure that people will not be shot on the streets for no apparent reason aside from the fact that they will not use something from the That's what I think the rights so, so when when you when you when you take when you, when you look at these arguments, right, you say no, 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 we have, we've got our Asian values, Asian values. Yeah, it's not. You should be extremely suspect of that because you know we look at the Asian values debate. Right, it comes from from you know from that way, right? That we are distinct, right? That we are different. That we we don't we we shouldn't give people the right to bear arms and all that. Look at how violent. Uh, Western society. So something that very important happened in Singapore last month. On National Day, Independence Day is August 9th. Uh, the week after that, our Prime Minister, who is the executive of the government, uh, always addresses the it's like a, a state of the nation address uh, one week after the National Day. And nobody expected it. But <clears throat> in, in different words, I'm paraphrasing, he said J sex is okay. For the longest time, British common law dictated that uh, this is very biased. Sex between men is illegal. Sex between women has always been okay. Right? Sex between men is illegal. It's called Section 377 also in Malaysia. Um, it has been on the books in Singapore until last month. And we were made to believe, leading up to that, that we are Asian society, we are conservative. Come on, you mean Singaporeans haven't been having gay sex at all? And that when the British came, we decided that hey, this is a, something like we want to try, like you know, a milkshake or ice cream, all these Western inventions, right? That's, that's not true. The other one that I think is interesting is the death penalty, which I think maybe Dr. Lel will talk about. That the gay sex, anti gay sex laws, has been repealed in the UK, United Kingdom in the 60s. I think the last uh, death uh, uh, execution in the UK was in the 40s. Singapore, well, I think, uh, in Malaysia, sorry, that's in Malaysia, 
Malaysia still practices uh, execution by hanging, still, and gay sex between men are still illegal. So it's, it's as if that there, there's, there's, there are things that we want to learn from colonialism that we are comfortable with, to run with, and that's fine. But there are things we then say, oh, because we are Asian, we are different, we, we cannot do things uh, exactly the way the rest would take to us. So these are very interesting questions that we need to think about. Yeah? It's not as clear cut as the West is bad and what we are doing for ourselves is good. And everything has to be individualized, and either at the religious level, the different age groups feel very differently about things. If you ask about human rights, if I ask this class if human rights is important, you will say yes. If you ask the next person you see on the streets outside of the way home, who's sitting on the floor with a cup, shaking some coins inside, you ask her whether human rights is important, she asks you, can I have a few pesos of coin? <laughs> you understand? But to, to, to us, it's a fundamental thing that uh, uh, as, as students and as faculty, it's a fundamental thing that we want to talk about. But at the end of the day, when, yeah, it's a bit um, reflexive, yeah? When the next time you walk by someone begging for a few pesos and you try to avoid eye contact, think about what that says about how you view human rights, right? So I was thinking about that. I walked by someone sitting in the rain yesterday and I tried not to look him in the eye because I knew he was looking at me walking towards him and I felt bad. <laughs> That's reflexivity, yeah? Thank you, uh, Dr. Young and Dr. Uh, Again, yeah, just like many uh, aspects of reality, given the concept of human rights, is something subjective. Okay. Um, are there any questions from uh, the audience? Yes. Um, again, I'm from All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having this talk. It's quite overwhelming. Uh, so many informations. <laughs> I'm not just nervous, I'm also breathing. So. <laughs> um, there is so much to tackle, but I guess it sparked as well so much in me with arguments and questions, I guess, especially in terms of the Philippines with regards to um, its um, history and colonization with the Spanish and the America, and I guess another um, to play the devil's advocate. Now everyone's gonna hate me for this, but the thing with Filipino identity as well, with their national identity, is we tend to say now we are poor. That's what we're identifying as. And I think does it have to do with our history of colonization, with specifically the this, Spain, this and after that. When the Americans arrived, did we I get, did they provide this sense of hope or a different image of national identity where where we can get out of this uh, idea of poverty of who we are as a nation? And does this progress the Philippines more? And is the path to modernization with where we are right now currently? And the, do we need to thank uh, the Americans for that? I guess because in our studies, especially in international studies, in my course, we we usually um, despise Western <laughs> 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 like, oh, they're bad, or uh, the UN is so Western, and we need to, I guess, uh, decolonize this. But then to think of it, we're going somewhat on the right track by following certain Western um, ideologies, especially in development. I don't know if I extended the question too much, <laughs> but you can answer any of what I just said. Thank you. So um, to just ask, uh, I read the questions of Juliana. I think it revolves around how uh, the concept of poverty for us can be connected to um, our colonial experiences. And um, uh, I think it's just right that we give a few moments uh, for our speakers to uh, uh, think of their answers. So. If it's okay, uh, I'll give uh, the mic to Sir Nathan. Being a Filipino, I think he can um, <laughs> start the overloading or uh, give the floor to our foreign guests. Um, that's a very interesting question regarding 
do we think that Americans um, um well if we will thank them for their impact in the Philippines, we're gonna also have to thank them for the political situation that we have right now. Uh, I mentioned a while ago that many of the problems you have today can be traced with them. Not necessarily with them, but what with what they did. Um a while ago, uh, there was there was uh, talks regarding how after colonization or post-colonization, institutions did not really change. What changed was who managed the institution. So instead of having a foreign power to manage society, you have the ethnic group or the local group. You know? And oftentimes, when you look at our political institutions or institutions in general, when we talk about elites in power, Elites that don't have an incentive to change a system rarely ever do change that system. Um, another point to make regarding um, what the Americans gave us, we have to remember that their institutions, their way of democracy, you want to call it a democracy, or their way of politics fits them. They are, in many literature, they would say that America is just so lucky to be where they are when they were. Uh, they only had one constitution. How many constitutions does the Philippines have already? How many constitutions does a former colony like Mexico have already? What I'm saying is the Americans are very lucky that their institutions work for them. But to simply say that we need to export Western ideas, Western systems in the Philippines and it will work one is to one, it's very erroneous to me. In, uh, in the current system right now, we're often talking about federalism and because you know we decide that America is good, Indonesia is good, they're economically uh, uh, they're, they're economically uh, progressive. So if we do that to the Philippines, that will happen to us. That is a very wrong justification to make. Systems have to be contextualized to the system. To the systems have to be contextualized. To the societies that they belong to. In fact, if people, if we are to even look at that idea, we already practice some level of federalism, in, but in a smaller scale, we call it devolution. If you look at your barangays, your barangays have autonomy to decide how they do what they do. That idea is very similar to um, federalism. The big difference is that they still follow a mandate by central government. But to simply say that that works, actually, there are a lot of studies that tell us otherwise. Changing the system just to fit some Western ideal rarely ever works. Because again, it works for them, but that doesn't mean it will work for us. Thank you. Very good question, Juliana. And uh, the way I say I see this is, and I uh, also build on the arguments presented by Professor Tan and you know, as well, is that I think one of the dangers of colonialism is what lingers is internalized colonialism, right? Like I mentioned. And again, it's also to borrow from Edward Said and the idea that. The colonizers have left our lands, yes, but they have not left our minds. This is where the danger is. As long as we maintain this view of ourselves through the lens of our colonizers, I mentioned that we are poor. We see ourselves poor in, in, in relative to who? To the colonizers. We're backward in relative to who? The colonizers. We trust them, right? We trust Western educated doctors. We trust their institution. I think as long as we maintain that mentality, it is very dangerous. So, but as long as that's corrected and adjusted, we can then, from that position of strength, borrow institutions that are beneficial to us. Because there are great things that international organizations have done. You know, at the efforts by the WHO with uh, distributing vaccines, even with the human rights, things like that. We cannot just say, uh, like Professor Khan mentioned, that we, you know, that's, you know, that's uh, we refuse these concepts. They are Western. No, it's okay to, to learn from others and build on uh, good practice. But I think what we need to adjust is our view of ourselves. And uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that younger generations are 
there is a change that I see. There is a, an idea of more pride of our national identity, acceptance of our difference, of our diversity. It's not just one race and better than the other. We are all equally good. You know, these ideas, and hopefully, we continue whether it's social media or whatever, maybe more exchange of ideas. Hopefully, there is there is a trend that we're moving to more acceptance of ourselves as well as the other. Thank you, Denise. And then now, um, let's hear from our uh, guest speakers and also perhaps. Uh, they can also add uh, their final words before we end this forum because we're already running out of uh, time. Okay, Dr. Okay. Um, I've noted that two very fine ladies have asked questions. I don't know about men. <laughs> anyway, um, in post colonial societies, I think there's, to me, it's, it's not uh, either or, but there's two general feelings amongst the population. Uh, amongst a smaller part of post-colonial society, of a smaller group of people being post-colonial killed, right? While I'm a politician or I'm rich and I'm saying that, oh, you know, uh, the, the colonists left us poor, but now we're doing it for ourselves, that we should be proud of it. But actually, in a way, they are self-conscious that they are the new colonists, right? And like I said, the term colonial. I may not be white, but I'm using the same institutions to get rich in their power. So there's post-colonial guilt. But even more concerning is post-colonial envy. Think about that. I was poor under the Spanish just because they were white and they exploited me. But what if you are poor Filipino today? You're still exploited by your brethren who are, who are supposed to be here to help you to better yourself. So the envy is, the colonists have gone. Where's my promise of a better life ahead of me? So think about that. That it's it's it's. I think today, if 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 uh, my my parting remarks would be, you, we must be able to understand different perspectives. Never be be stubborn. I, I'm Singaporean, and I take a lot of crap from people like like Dr. Young because I'm also self conscious that, like I said, I. I'm educated in the British system. I speak English. You know, I I think uh, in, in terms of Western education, uh, uh, the way I think about it. If you ask me anything about Chinese, I speak Mandarin, but that's about as much as I, I know about my Chinese culture. So, so I, I'm very aware that that we are imbued in, in Southeast Asia. We are in, uh, last point. You know how we say democracy makes people happier. Or, or well makes people happier. Two things. If you Google the World Happiness Index, the happiest people in the world come from one of the poorest countries in the world, Bhutan, and they are a, a monarchy. Some of the happiest people in Southeast Asia, if you look at surveys, do not come from the democratic countries. They come from Bhutan and Darussalam, where it's a hundred percent monarchy, and they don't have even a working government where you can vote for. Because my uncle who, who lives, and he's Singaporean, but he lives and works in Brunei, once you are part of that system, you get free education, free healthcare, free land to build houses on. If the Brunei government cannot treat your illness, they will fly you to Singapore, paid for by the, the Brunei government for you to see a Singapore doctor. Screw democracy, right? Who needs democracy when you can wake up to an authoritarian monarchy and still be happy? Yeah, it has to be great. But that, that's the last point. I'll leave the last word to Dr. Leo. Thank you. And I've been very happy. I thought I'll just come here and have some adobo and have some San Miguel and call it a day. But this has been Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Danny. Uh, Dr. Young? <laughs> no, I don't want to start with him because every time he says something, it's so cringe. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's right? Yeah, great. Everyone's happy there. So, you know, I don't think there's anyone there who has to say that you're unhappy. That, that's the thing. Because once you say you're unhappy, then that's it. You know, what's going to happen to you? <laughs> 
great you can be thrown out <laughs> So they call you to be given a free university education. Uh, I, I, yeah, and even for what then to continue to live in that kind of position and situation? So I, I think right. Okay, so so that's like a, a philosophical issue. Right? But what I, I really want to, to say right now is wherever it is we go, right? Whether we want to talk about criticize, we have want to have a dialogue about colonialism, post-colonialism, whatever. I think the the reality is right. Everything that holds up, or uh, all the institutions that we have in every single South Asian uh, country in this region, right, is built on Western institutions. Right? We talk about parliaments, presidential systems, prime ministers, prime ministers, uh, opposition, Congress, Senate. All of that are all all these are all Western institutions. Okay, so the 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 thing that I want to leave behind, right, is to talk about. What then can we do to strengthen these institutions? What then can we do to make sure that a president or a prime minister cannot have access to a slush fund, which doesn't need to be accounted for to do whatever the hell he wants? What can we do to stop these people, right, from going over and going overboard in terms of how they will use and abuse? Howler. Like I always said, right? Great, you know, I'd love to be a good idea too. Everything's taken care of, right? And I'm so happy to be a cow. Right? I love it. All right? You give me a nice stable environment, you give me enough stuff to eat, you make sure I have enough money to earn. I'm so happy, and then over the weekends, I can go over the orchard road and shop my life for it. Great. But there has to be something beyond that, right? There has to be a greater question. That's the, and he's starting to bridge now. Like, 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 the, like, and so institutionalization, strengthening the institutions, making sure that abuse and corruption doesn't happen is one of the most important things to think about. This, despite whatever it is we have to say about how horrible colonial has been, right? We have a base the reality in that we have these institutions. How do we make them better? I think one of the more interesting things that we don't often think about as well, right, when we talk about democracy, is democracy is not the final destination. It's not the, the, the final shiny senior appeal that we reach. And that's it. No, there's not, there's no such thing. Democracy is problematic. The, democracy has so many flaws, but at the very least, right, it gives us the opportunity to be able to fix things that we don't, that we think is not correct. And one of the last things also right, that I want to talk to you guys about right, is one of the, the most important thing in the democracy right, is to ask, what do we want to get from this democracy? Right? Not not fried chicken, not not lemon tea, not whatever, right? What are we, what do we want from this democracy? And how much are we willing to go to protect it? So that we can continue to ask what it is that we want. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to our um, speakers and to our reactors. And I think I speak for everyone. Um, as I say, that this is perhaps one of the uh, liveliest and most fun uh, webinar I've attended for in my time. Of course, uh, this, the credit belongs to our speakers who somehow, I think, uh, despite their differences, are very good friends. And <laughs> I, uh, I sincerely hope that we get to continue these conversations with, of course, students um, next time. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, to our speakers and to our actors. Now, at this point, we shall award our certificates and tokens of appreciation. So may I invite Mr. Francis Esteban, the department chair of the International Committee, to award the certificate. And may I also request Mr. Um, Jules Arceo to assist Mr. Francis Esteban in the awarding of certificates. So
So to award our certificates, we shall first award our first guest speaker, Dr. Karyen Leong. The certificate reads, uh, the Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Karyen Leong, PhD, for his invaluable contribution as a resource speaker in the special lecture entitled Parallelism between the war in Ukraine and Taiwan China relations held during the launching of the SDU Global Initiative given the 30th day of September 2022 at Far Eastern University in Manila, signed by the Dean of Institute of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Rowena Capulo Reyes, and our Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Maria Teresa Trinidad. Can you all give them a round of applause? And to continue to award our Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Danny Dan, this Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Dr. Danny Dan for his invaluable contribution as a resource speaker in the special lecture entitled Majority Ethnic Groups and the State, Malays of Malaysia, held during the launching of the FU Global Initiative, given the 30th day of September 2022 at Far Eastern University, Manila, signed by Dean Rowena Papulo Reyes and our SVP for Academic Affairs, Dr. Maria Teresa Trinidad. Continue again a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our actors will also be awarded their certificates. First is for Mr. Nathan Go to read. This certificate of appreciation is awarded to Nathan Go for his invaluable contribution as the panel actor in the seminar entitled Contemporary Development Issues in Asia, held during the launching of the FU Global Initiative given the 30th day of September 2022 at Far Eastern University, Manila, signed by our Dean Rowena Papulo Reyes and SBPAA Maria Teresa Trinidad Dino. A round of applause for Mr. Nishikawa. Of appreciation is awarded to Ms. Susan Hurley for her invaluable contribution as a panel actor in the seminar entitled Contemporary Development Issues in Asia, held during the launching of the FU Global Initiative, given the 30th day of September 2022 at Far Eastern University, Manila, signed by Dean Rowena Papula Reyes and FPPAA Maria Teresa Trinidad Quirino. Let us all give them a round of applause. Okay, so maybe you're, uh, so for those who would like to say a photo opportunity, okay, thank you. And I, I, I'm thinking that um, Sir Dan Tan would also watch this for Instagram. <laughs> okay. Um, and this ends our event for today, everyone. Thank you very much for the Thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Recording stopped.